Okay, hello everyone and a very, very warm welcome to today's IIED debates where we're going to be looking towards a nature positive economic recovery post COVID-19. We are really delighted to be hosting today's event with the Green Economy Coalition. A uh, huge thanks to all of you, our audience, for arriving promptly uh, and being in being part of our, our virtual space today. We've got a really fantastic panel lined up and I'm uh, certainly looking forward to hearing their their insights from a new global analysis on integrating nature into COVID-19 recovery plans and budgets. My name is Juliet. I'm the events officer at IID, and I'll be um, kind of behind the scenes today, uh, providing some technical support. And with that, I am absolutely delighted to hand over to Najma Mohammed. She is the policy director at the Green Econ Economy, Economy Coalition and our moderator for today's discussion. Najma, over to you, please. Thank you so much, uh, Juliet, and good day, everybody, wherever you're joining from, and thank you for joining us um, at this webinar. So today we want to be sharing with you insights emerging from a global analysis on integrating nature into COVID-19 uh, recovery plans and budgets. I lead the policy team at the Green Economy Coalition, which is the world's largest movement working towards a just transition to green and fair economies. So 2020 was meant to be a major policy year for nature. Governments were expected to gather in Kunming in China to draft new 10-year targets to protect nature. Countries were preparing to ramp up their ambition and to address climate change, including the use of nature-based solutions. And we were grappling with the alarm bell from global biodiversity scientists at the start of 2020, that nature was actually declining globally at rates never seen before in human history. But the bigger challenge of the COVID pandemic was awaiting all of us. And it was at this moment that the, the GEC, the Green Economy Coalition, through the Economics for Nature project, initiated a global policy analysis to look at how nature was being integrated in economic decision-making. And for the last two years, as we all know, decision-making has been dominated by how countries respond to the pandemic, the pandemic ensuring the well-being of people and how we support economic recovery. Thank you, Juliet, if I could have the next slide. So you will see on the next slide that we were a partnership that really supported um, one another and worked on, on this program of work over the last year. Um, as you can see today, we are from different parts of the world. Um, the partnership brings together uh, Brazil, uh, France, uh, India, and Uganda um, with the Green Economy Coalition and our partner institution, IIED, based um, in London. Next slide, please, Juliet. Um, <clears throat> So the team, I think, were unequivocal in our commitment, really, um, uh, to the words of, of the UN Secretary General, that we felt um, that COVID recovery and our planet's repair must be two sides of the same coin. And even as we continue to move through different phases of the pandemic, we're beginning to realize how integral our economies, our integral relationship and the connection between our economies and societies are. Uh, next slide, please, Juliet. So across the world, there's been a growing consensus on the need to include green spending and measures in how we recover from the pandemic. We're beginning to see that green spending in um, renewable energy, in better ways of transport, in waste management, um, in, in a greener agriculture is beginning to shape some of our COVID-19 stimulus and recovery packages. But for the most part, global analysis shows that most COVID recovery plans still underinvest in nature. And yet nature underpins economy and, and our society on multiple levels. We see you know, more than half of the world's GDP either moderately or very highly dependent on nature, as our colleagues today will tell us from, from Brazil and from India, Uganda, where there's a very high dependence on nature. Um, yet one fifth of countries are at risk of the ecosystems collapsing. And for the more than 1.2 billion workers whose jobs and livelihoods depend on healthy, stable ecosystems on nature, investing in nature seems obvious. But what are our governments doing? Next slide, please. So the national partners joining me here today will share with us some of the headline findings on how COVID recovery plans and national budgets are prioritizing or not nature. They've analyzed national spending and I identified nature positive and nature negative recovery investments, and they've made recommendations on how the countries can sustain and conserve nature as part of their recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
I'm delighted to be joined with the, with the partners um, today. Marisol Goes, Amazon Green Economy Hub convener based at the Amazon Sustainable Foundation in Brazil. Christophe Picami, research consultant at Vertigo Lab in France. Uh, Shatab Data, manager for policy and planning at Development Alternatives in India. And Aaron Werike, a national planner and consultant for Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment in Uganda. It's a pleasure to be amongst the colleagues and friends here today, and we're looking forward to a really good discussion. Joining me today also is Paul Steele, who is chief economist in IIED and was partnering with the GEC on this work. And Paul is one of the technical leads and advisors on the project, and he will share the synthesis findings. So before we start, let me just um, remind you, if you've joined a bit later, that um, the, the chat function is there for you to introduce yourself, get to know um, one another, say hello to friends that you might be seeing here. And the Q&A function is particularly for you to pose your questions. So I know, Marisol, we've had this discussion multiple times in the year that we've met, and you've always said that Brazil goes first. So let's not break that tradition today, Marisol, and let's hand over to you to, to kickstart our discussion today. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Najma. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at this event and launch our, our case study on green recovery in the Amazon. Just a brief introduction, I'm the Amazon Bioeconomy Hub convener. The Amazon Bioeconomy Hub is an alliance between Foundation for Amazon Sustainability Pass and Green Economy Coalition. We exist to connect, develop, and scale up Amazonian bioeconomy solutions at national regional and global level. In the past 14 years, FAS alongside uh, its partners has been developing solutions with proofs that a green and inclusive economy is possible in the Amazon. And why Amazon green recovery matters, uh, Amazon is the largest and most bioculture diverse ecosystem on earth. And the figures on this slide uh, demonstrate that uh, but Amazon is very close to reaching a tipping point of no return. Uh, recently, the science panel for the Amazon revealed that the situation is very critical with existential uh, implications for Amazon people who are already uh, feeling the impacts of climate change and for climate regulation and economic consequences for the planet. So Brazil was hit very hard by the COVID pandemic, but the Amazon area uh, was one of the hardest hitting uh, of the more than 600,000 deaths, almost 12% occurred in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, please, Juliet, next slide. Uh, so in Brazil, more than, thank you, Juliet. Uh, in Brazil, more than 114 billion in tax and budget execution was expanded to combat the effect of the pandemic in 2020, uh, which represents around 7% uh, of national GDP. Most of this resource was allocated to the health sector and to minimize the socioeconomic effect caused by the pandemic. Uh, we, uh, we noticed uh, and we can uh, report that natural capital was not considered as Najma informed as a driver of these measures. Uh, in fact, there is no clear policy in Brazil or initiative from the federal government to promote a green economy recovery response as a way to mitigate uh, the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. Uh, out of this resource, an estimated uh, around 10 uh, billion uh, dollars has been applied in the Amazon, Amazon region, impacting natural capital in, in some way. So you can see uh, among the negative measures uh, on the left, we can report that agribusiness was considered the, the priority economic sector. Uh, furthermore, nine infrastructure concessions were foreseen to 2021 uh, uh, and 10 regu regulatory acts that had weakening the environmental governance in mining, fishing, and forestry. On the other hand, we had some positive measures in family farming, low carbon agriculture, a promotion of bioeconomy programming, a connectivity and sanitation improvement projects. 
Uh, next slide, please, Juliet. Uh, just to finish in this final slide, among the economic stimulus measures analyzed in our study, uh, we, we can say that 87.2% uh, were expected to negatively impact natural capital in the Amazon, while around 10% would contribute positively. And in 20.9%, uh, there's uncertainty about the impact. So uh, as I demonstrate, there is no green recovery move coming from the federal government in Brazil. Uh, however, what we can see is an unprecedented movement happening at the subnational level with, with local governors a converging efforts, a converging several public and private actors into a green recovery in the area. So facing the absence of protagonism coming from the federal government in the promotion of the uh, green recovery, uh, the governors of the state of the legal Amazon, uh, they launched in July of this year, the what we call PRIV, uh, the green recovery plan, the Amazon green recovery plan, and with some guidelines and priorities for the region. And FAS is one of the organizations that has been acting in helping implementing and disseminating this plan in the, in the Amazon area. So this study uh, was developed by the Amazon Bioeconomy Hub uh, with the support of my colleague, Carlos Rigolo, is aimed at supporting local government and in the implementation of this plan, the PRV uh, in the region. So I end this presentation and I thank again GC, IIED and Economics for Nature for this opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Marisol, and you were excellent in, in keeping to time. Um, luckily for me, it's been months of working together and, and seeing, you know, the richness in the story that, that you're telling. Um, I hope we've got lots of time, you know, that we, that we all stay to, to time in our presentations and we can have lots of, you know, good discussions um, on, on, on the presentation. So just a reminder, if you've got a question for Marisol, please use the Q&A function. You can ask her a question directly on, on the presentation. Or, or perhaps um, listen to all, all four or five presentations and, and formulate your question um, thereafter. So um, let me hand over now to Franz, to, to Christoph. Uh, please go ahead, Christoph. Thank you, Najma. And thank you, Marisa. It was a great presentation. Uh, so my name is Christophe Picamil. Uh, I work for uh, Vertigolab, which is a small French company specialized in uh, socioeconomic and environmental evaluation. Uh, so concerning the study we have conducted with GEC, so uh, we have uh, evaluated the impact on, on biodiversity of the French recovery plan, which was presented in September uh, 2020 uh, with a budget of 100 billion euros. Uh, the French recovery plan, which, it, which is called uh, Plan Relance, includes uh, six, 64 measures we have uh, classified according to their impacts on uh, natural capital. Um, so um, major uh, measures of, the, uh, of this plan include a substantial tax reduction for French companies. French companies, uh, they support um, employment measure, the car and the industry, and also public investment in the health sector. Therefore, the study um, concluded that uh, most of the French recovery plan budget uh, is very um, difficult. I mean, its impacts on biodiversity are very ambiguous and difficult to analyze. Uh, almost half of its budget uh, was qualified either as impossible to assess or uh, as neutral. And only, uh, as you can see, only 1% of uh, its budget is expected to have um, a strong positive impact uh, on natural capital. Um, so we consider, despite the strong dependence of the French economy on biodiversity, uh, the government uh, has missed the opportunity to invest in nature and to truly integrate uh, natural capital into decision making. Uh, next slide, please. 
Thank you. So our recommendations uh, aim at uh, reducing the uncertainty concerning uh, its impacts on uh, biodiversity and to uh, integrating nature-based solution um, in order to increase human well-being and to bring uh, immediate economic benefits to uh, French society. Um, our recommendation include um, adding environmental conditions to industry and, car and uh, companies and company support measure because they represent an important part of the plan um, and the number of uncertainties sorry, is uh, very important. So in order to protect a natural capital, it will be essential for the French government to focus its investments toward the environmentally friendly sectors. Another uh, recommendation will be to um, monitor uh, the implementation of announced measure uh, met uh, because um, and, uh, measures, uh, I mean, some of its measures support the car and the air industry, which are sectors which can be which can be harmful to the to biodiversity. And the last recommendation we have made uh, was to system uh, systematize um, nature-based solution because they can bring immediate uh, economic stimulus to uh, society. Uh, so that's for me. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I hand over to Najma. Thank you. Merci, Christophe. Thank you so much. I, I think, you know, we, we're hearing from, from Marisol and, and we saw the figures of the percentage going towards agribusiness in, uh, in, in the Amazon, um, you know, recovery efforts uh, or the recovery efforts in, uh, in, in the region. And from Christophe, we've heard, you know, in France, the, the type of industries that, that are being supported. I think hopefully when we get into the Q&A, we we'll have an opportunity to share with you the incredible richness of experience and exchange you know, amongst the team and, um, and how in very different economies and geographies across the world, you know, we, we found that we could um, learn from one, another, one, from one another, but also the strategies, as, as we will hear later, of engaging um, our governments. So let me hand over to Shatabdi from India to share their story. And it was very interesting to see um, how the, the interesting exchange between France and, and India, you know, in the area of agriculture and both countries, you know, wanting to commit to an agroecological uh, transition and having ambitions in, in that direction. So um, over to you, Shatati. Uh, you on mute? Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks Najma. Thank yeah, yeah. So uh, this is Shatabdi from Development Alternative. So we are, we are a civil society organization in India. So as a part of this study, we also did uh, analysis of the COVID recovery package of the government. So to understand how natural capital is represented in the governmental budget. So uh, it is quite evident that India has also widespread impacts of the pandemic on lives, livelihood and the economy. So uh, to come out of this pandemic, of the economic impacts of the pandemic, a green economic recovery is fundamental to cope with the external shocks and to meet developmental goals. So as uh, like Najma has already emphasized before that uh, like India is heavily dependent like uh, natural capital and biodiversity rich country and uh, it majorly contributes to the various sectors like agriculture, forestry, uh, uh, tourism, and also contribute to a generation of livelihoods. Uh, Judith, next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, in the COVID recovery budget, so the government announced uh, a COVID recovery package uh, in 2021, 2020, 2021 financial year. So it amounted to uh, 260 billion USD. Uh, so uh, in this budget, we uh, some of the priority sectors uh, that were there were agriculture and the light sector, micro, small and medium enterprise sector, rural development, mining and power sector. 
so we found that almost 18% of the total allocations in these five sectors had positive natural capital impact but uh, it was quite surprising that uh, a major chunk of the allocations were ambiguous like we couldn't uh, identify the direction of natural capital impact of those uh, interventions whether those have positive or negative influence on natural capital but uh, there also existed a few uh, good policies which were relevant for green recovery but there also had some uh, gaps certain gaps which uh, i'm uh, coming later uh, and also uh, we looked at the annual budget of the uh, current financial year uh, for the same five sectors. So here we found that uh, it had uh, quite a, a lot of positive natural capital uh, allocations, like almost 50% of the uh, annual budget had uh, positive allocations. Uh, Juliet, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, on the left, uh, we have identified a few gaps in these uh, policies in these two budgets. So we found that uh, there in the COVID recovery package, it had it mostly focused on monetary policy rather than fiscal policies, and also uh, there are certain schemes were ambiguous uh, in terms of outcomes uh, that could uh, impact natural capital and. Uh, in spite of having certain good policies, uh, there existed gaps in implementation and last mile connectivity. There were inequality in access to uh, the benefits of those policies. And also uh, uh, certain policies didn't have uh, consistent allocations in the budget. Uh, so from this, we uh, came up with certain recommendations for the government. Uh, for example, uh, it is very important to strengthen uh, the natural capital positive schemes and emphasis on uh, the equitable implementation at national and subnational level. Uh, and while uh, designing the policies, uh, we need to focus on uh, both short term and long term strategies. We need to uh, strengthen the environmental regulations. Uh, there has to be a balance between fiscal and monetary policy interventions. And also, uh, while designing the policies, uh, uh, when the uh, government policymakers are defining the outcome targets, uh, natural capital component needs to be considered so that uh, the, it has a defined outcome target towards creating positive impact on natural capital and a sufficient scheme level information uh, are needed on public forums to conduct more uh, these kind of studies and analysis. Uh, and also we need to engage more with policymakers and different relevant stakeholders uh, to further drive green and inclusive uh, economic recovery. Yeah, so that's all uh, from my side. Thank you. Uh, over to Najma. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shatapti. And uh, let me hand over now to our last national partner from Uganda, um, Aaron. And, and I remember Aaron shared something on one of our team meetings that really struck me because Uganda is a country that's been engaging, you know, with natural capital mainstreaming for a while. Um, you know, there are national accounts in place for natural capital accounting. And I remember, you know, Aaron said something very significant. He said, you can have all the laws and the institutions in place, but then, you know, the money has got to flow, you know, in, in that direction. So, so Aaron, let me not take any more of your time. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you, Najma. Uh, yeah, thank you, Juliet, for the, for the slides. Well, uh, to continue from where you've stopped, Najma, Uganda is largely a natural capital reliant country with agriculture accounting for about a quarter of the GDP and employing over 70% of the population. When you look at our GDP composition, tourism is a very key player and forestry, and yet tourism is largely motivated by nature. It is natural based tourism. So nature plays really a key role and significant role in our 
economic development. With COVID-19, uh, we had to have a number of interventions, but unlike the previous three countries, we didn't have a standalone uh, COVID-19 recovery package. It was rather integrated in the conventional annual budgeting system. So our COVID-19 recovery packages were in the form of the national budgets for the last fin two financial years and some additional interventions for selected institutions to resuscitate the, uh, the, econ the businesses. So to start with our first economic recovery package of which is uh, the budget for the financial 2020, 2021, which ended in July, in June this year, uh, the budget was themed on stimulating the economy to safeguard livelihoods, jobs, businesses, and industrial recovery. And our analysis in partnership with uh, Jake and IIED revealed that 40% of this budget or this recovery package was responsive to natural capital. That means either positively or negatively, although only 3.7% was allocated to water and environment, but there were other interventions on natural capital which were found in other programs on agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, among others. So 40% being compliant means that 60% of the remainder of the budget was neutral or ambiguous, like my friends have informed on governance and other issues which are not very related to natural capital. Now, of the 40% which was uh, compliant to natural capital, which was impacting natural capital, 70% of that was strong positive, 15% weak positive, and 15% strong negative. Uh, the 7% being strong positive implies that these were interventions which were tailored to uh, activities that work for natural capital, such as uh, restoration of forests, demarcating forest boundaries, en enhancing compliance enforcement to environmental pollution, among others. But also, like I've informed, our economy is, revolves around natural capital. So the, ex the percentages are kind of obvious and given because we are, it is, we are not a very highly industrialized country. It is mainly primary agriculture production and uh, other interventions which are reliant on nature without really polluting the environment. However, there were also strong interventions, strong negative interventions, such as clearance of uh, bush for agriculture, uh, virgin, clearing virgin areas for agriculture, and prioritization of a number of crops, such as sugar canes, which are in fragile ecosystems like forestry reserves and have over the years been key drivers of natural capital depletion. So for the second recovery package, which is uh, the budget for the 2020, 2021, the current financial year, this was also themed on speeding up economic recovery and driving inclusive, driving inclusive growth. Uh, but this was much less impactful on natural capital with only 28% of it found to be responsive to natural capital management with even a further de decline in what was earmarked for the water and environment interventions, those which follow under the mandated institutions charged with uh, conserving natural capital. Of the 28% interventions which were found to be responsive to natural capital, 60% were strong positive, 26% were weak positive, and 13% were strong negative. And uh, just to highlight on the strong negative interventions, we had uh, issues such as purchase of land for palm oil production in one of the islands in Lake Victoria. And palm oil has been uh, a key driver of deforestation on one, on one other island where forests were cleared to really pave way for commercial palm oil plantations. And yet it had no clear biodiversity offsets plans. And then uh, the budget was also inclined to stimulating and kickstarting our industrialization agenda and petroleum development, although no resources were earmarked to ensure that these are happen in compliance with the environment and natural resource management issues such as enforcement of compliance to uh, to the permits for water resources management were really not uh, highlighted and they were quite silent in the recovery package and also there were no interventions on how to manage the COVID-19 waste strain so those were some of the negative interventions equally important there was nothing on electronic waste, which is quite increasing. So the budget was only 28% responsive to natural capital with uh, some positive, strong positive interventions and other weak positive interventions. Can we 
continue, Juliet. Julie, yeah, now besides the bigger recovery packages, which are the two budgets for the previous two financial years, as I informed, there were some direct interventions or money which was uh, advanced to a number of institutions like the Uganda Development Bank. This one lends out to businesses. Now, the, the allocations of the, 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 what was allocated to natural capital was uh, assessed and noted that the bank has environmental sustainability as one of its principles. And the disbursement of this money, 30% of it went to agriculture, 30% to agro industry. That those are industries which are engaged now in agriculture production and productivity. Then 23% went to manufacturing. However, there was uh, no clarity of information on, on what actual interventions were implemented because of the, uh, the confidential nature of lending, whereby the banks may not want to disclose exactly what their clients are. Uh, are using the money for having signed uh, disclosure agreements with them. So this was not very uh, assessed deeply because of the scarcity and the scant information available. Then lastly, in terms of uh, monetary policy, the COVID-19 response did not only was largely inclined to the fiscal policy as showed by the budgets and the government expenditure to Uganda Women Bank, but there are also other specific uh, policy, fiscal policy interventions, which are really uh, work for nature or against it. Uh, we have uh, the deficit financing, which engaged borrowing, of course, to address some of the interventions of natural capital which have been addressed in the previous two uh, recovery packages. But also there are some shortfalls in our fiscal policy whereby uh, the money collected from environmental levies, environmental taxes is not, is plowed back to the is put in the consolidated fund. It's not really, there is no clarity on whether this money is used to address environmental issues. So there is a likelihood that money which is gotten from environmental fines, environmental taxes and penalties is in, used to degrade the environment in one way or another because the, there is no disclosure of information on, on the flow and expenditure of the revenue collected from uh, environmental taxes. So that is a gap in the fiscal policy, which we think as we recover needs to be addressed. And then lastly, the monetary policy goal of uh, uh, is to maintain the inflation rate at 5%. And natural capital has a key role to play here because our inflation rate is largely driven by food prices. Whenever we have food scarcity, we have uh, inflation rising uh, hyperly because uh, food prices are a key determinant of inflation. Can, can we move to the recommendations? Um, Aaron, can I ask you to use uh, one minute to, to wrap up? And, and okay. also I see in the chat that Juliet has posted the Uganda study. So um, that's also okay. available for, for participants to look, to look at. So what, one minute for your recommendations, um, um, Aaron. Uh, I think they've come. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. For, for, for the recommendations, we, we, we're looking at two things, largely ensuring that the budget the budget before it is before the budget is passed in parliament is scrutinized through a natural capital lens and we 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 are working with the advocates coalition for development and environment which is a court to ensure that this comes to fruition and also coming up with physical uh, environmental reforms because currently natural capital is underpriced uh, the externalities from development are not captured in the in the prices of goods and services so natural capital is treated as a free good which uh, fuels its degradation. So we are calling for fiscal environment reforms, which really integrate natural capital also in the pricing and in the taxes in, uh, imposed on uh, a number of producers and factories. And lastly, we needed uh, an engagement strategy with uh, policymakers who are in parliament, in the Ministry of Finance, to ensure that uh, the budgets and the plannings are highly informed and reliant on natural capital accounting, which, which generally we've already commenced on. And I think with these recommendations once implemented, we shall be able to get to that. Uh, thank you, Najma, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Aaron. I, I don't think that um, the five minutes we've allocated to each of the national partners would do justice, right, Paul, to the incredible discussions that we've had as a team over the last few months of the learning that, that's happened, you know, between partners. Paul, would you take us in the last few minutes before we open up the Q&A and just a reminder, if you haven't yet, please post your questions in the Q&A and then we can have a look at them and, and vote for the ones that you want us to prioritize. 
Paul, maybe some some uh, some from your side to share, you know, on some of the country learnings that have emerged. Uh, great, thanks, uh, Najma and uh, and other colleagues who presented. It's been a real privilege to work with such an engaged and active team representing um, analysts actually in their own countries who could get the, the data and uh, discuss it with policymakers and follow up and disseminate the findings. So I'm just going to present two quick slides before we open up for discussion uh, and uh, should have about 20 minutes there. But the first slide, as you see, takes all the different bits of data that has been presented from the rich uh, national studies and tries to summarize it on one graph. And you see at the bottom there, strong positive impact, low positive impact, low negative impact, strong negative impact, neutral, and then unable to assess. And, uh, and this kind of methodology uh, we uh, developed as a group and refined and then discussed several times. So this is very much a group set of uh, uh, findings that I'm presenting. So you see strong positive impact represented by the, particularly by the blue uh, column is Uganda. So uh, as uh, Aaron presented, despite uh, some hiccups, by and large, the uh, COVID uh, recovery package in the budget was a strongly positive impact on natural capital. So that shows that Uganda, if you like, has a lot of positive lessons to share uh, other countries. Uh, second, moving to the second uh, set of uh, columns, no positive impact, uh, and uh, and then and then uh, was particularly the case of France, where um, you see that uh, there were some positive impacts, particularly uh, around some of the areas that um, Christophe presented, uh, like uh, organic agriculture and so on. I think it was. Uh, then moving to low negative impact, there you see Brazil coming out almost 90%. So by and large, the focus in Brazil, as we've heard from Marisol, was on the agribusiness, and that had generally uh, low negative impacts on natural capital. Not surprisingly, many of the uh, agribusinesses are likely to impact and cut down uh, pre-existing forest lands. Then moving to strong negative impact, a combination of uh, Uganda and India. So we, uh, we heard from India that there were some uh, negative impacts, particularly around mining, uh, as Shatabdi presented, and as you can see from their country report. In terms of neutral, there were some, um, some issues, and then particularly in, in India and a bit in France, some areas were unable to assess in the term um, it's going to depend on how the uh, how the uh, funding plays out, and I'll come back to that in my final slide, uh, Juliet. Please. So these are uh, six recommendations, again based on the four country studies, and this was discussed, I think, twice by the team in our monthly or six weekly uh, team calls. So again, it's very much uh, a team effort. So it's recommendations for the COVID recovery, which will be presented along with the summaries of the synthesis of the uh, country studies in what we're calling a synthesis report, which will all be collectively co-authoring and will hopefully come out in the next uh, couple of months or so. So the first one uh, point that all of us have been making is governments should invest in natural capital to bring out to bring economic benefits, growth opportunities. Uh, I mean, it's an obvious point for the audience here, but we still need to make the point clearly to governments and to other, other and to parliamentarians and so on who control the budget. Uh, secondly, and perhaps this is uh, a more novel point, but did emerge from the uh, the uh, findings, governments need to recognise that natural capital investments drive social inclusion. So they're not just good for nature, but they're also good for poor people, particularly. Uh, poor women and men who are at the front line of uh, suffering the impacts of, of natural capital degradation. And just to give some examples, we've heard uh, um, uh, particularly from India and, and so on about uh, small and medium scale enterprises and how these are important uh, to receive uh, 
COVID recovery funds, and many of these SMEs are dependent on nature, such as uh, small and medium scale enterprises in the agri food processing business, also indigenous rights, uh, particularly the case of from Amazon, but also some other countries. I'm sure you can think of your own country if you're in the if, if you're participating, where indigenous rights are hugely linked to uh, to nature. And then social protection, again, to take the example of India, one of the things that happened uh, is that India has this enormous, I think it's probably the world's biggest social protection scheme, the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, uh, which uh, depends on investing in watersheds and that received from some additional COVID recovery funds. Third recommendation is that governments should link credit facilities to environmental conditionality. We heard a bit about this from Aaron in Uganda, but it applies pretty much to all the countries. And actually, this is one of the issues why uh, in some countries it was unclear, it was it, challenging to assess the impacts of the, uh, of the recovery funds on natural capital, because depending on the extent to which credit facilities uh, such as banking loans and bank and uh, uh, loans to the uh, development banks uh, were linked to uh, environmental conditionality. It wasn't clear to what extent these would be good or bad for the environment, and we heard about that from uh, from I think Uganda and also from France. Then I've already mentioned this: governments should support some environmentally friendly small small and medium uh, scale enterprises. Fifthly. Uh, particularly the case of Brazil, but also other countries, government should support uh, small scale agriculture and not support environmentally damaging agribusiness. And then finally, uh, particularly from India, government should not support environmentally damaging mining. So I'll stop there and hand over to Najma and look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul. I mean, the, the, the questions are, are really great. We've got about 15 minutes in our time to, to get to the questions. And, and I think um, let, let's kick start off. Um, so Anna's question got the most votes. So um, Anna's asking the question, how important do you see public-private finance schemes being today's finance to fund nature positive solutions? How do you see the future of public-private intersection evolving? That's the one question. So I'm going to take, the, I'll just mention the three questions and I'll while I give the, um, the panelists a time to think about it. Um, the second question, um, which I think Marisol, you might have addressed in the chat, but I'm happy if you uh, if you want to just um, share it again, is one um, from Steve uh, Bass, um, who asks about, you know, the, the mentions the Brazil State Governors um, Initiative and, and, and the new Amazon Recovery Green Recovery Plan. And what would you advise governors to do that would make the biggest difference in shifting from deforestation to a conservation-based economy? And the third question that, I, that I'd like to take is, Leah, I think from one from Chris, because I think this brings a sort of cross-country um, learning. Were there any examples of nature-positive COVID recovery policy interventions that were common across the countries and any negative policies that the countries shared? So looking to the panel, we would like to take Anna's question. Um, and if we don't have time, um, may I also ask panelists, uh, perhaps also see if we can answer some of the questions we won't get to um, while while they, um, while they respond to the ones we're going to take on the webinar. So anyone up for the first question? The um, public-private financing schemes and how they can I be think, used to raise think, finance. Marisol, okay. I see that on, but I'll give you the first go. Go ahead. Yes, in, in our case in, in Amazon, uh, first of all, I, I thank you, Anna, for the question. Uh, in, in Amazon, uh, we, we've seen these, uh, especially hybrid uh, financial mechanisms that has been arising in the past three years. And they, they prove being very important because they tend to be more patient capital, uh, especially for, uh, for example, businesses at early stage, uh, which requires a more patient uh, investment and and private and public they tend to to make this uh, this philanthropy uh, a strategic philanthropy mechanisms which are more adherent to the reality 
of the, the businesses, uh, the forest-based enterprises in, in the Amazon. So uh, I do believe that this uh, is already a reality in, in, in the area and it, it, it has provoked, uh, I am, uh, it has emerged, it has helped it to, to boost uh, an innovative ecosystem in, in the Amazon. So, so I do believe that uh, this, this is this is a reality already. It's not just a future, but it's already a reality, at least in, in the Amazon. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marisol. Aaron, do you want to come back? Would you want to come on that question before we move to the other questions, the sort of models and opportunities for public and private finance to come together for nature yeah. positive recovery? Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Najma. Yeah, I think uh, the outlook for public related partnerships and investment for nature is bright because it is increasingly becoming clear that the private sector has to really uh, integrate natural capital in its operations and going beyond just having a relationship of corporate social responsibility to actual investment. So we've seen a number of uh, uh, local green enterprises coming up and also a number of investors and even some banks coming up with uh, financial products in form of equity to, to finance innovative natural capital responsive interventions. So I think the future is, uh, is, uh, is, is bright, but also to nurture it more, the public sector or the development, government owned development financing institutions need to de-risk the investments in natural capital enterprises to be able to address those uh, imp impending factors which inhibit investment by putting in place the re relevant infrastructure or coming up with a low cost credit to attract more investors in natural capital because it is a new market and the returns are not yet clear, but the future is bright. Thank you. Absolutely, Aaron. Thank you. And thank you, Aaron and Marisol, for, for your responses. So, so Marisol, the next question is, is, is for you. So why you, you you think about that? Let me just give Christopher and, and Shatabti maybe a heads up to start thinking about the question, you know, what is common um, amongst the, the countries. But maybe let me just add on this sort of public private sector question before I hand back to you, Marisol, is that I think what really struck me from, from across the countries is that there was a lot of investment going towards um, infrastructure in, uh, you know, across the countries. And I do think, I mean, I was struck, Marisol, when, when, when um, Carlos from your team was speaking about, you know, the positive impact on, on sanitation infrastructure on the natural capital in the Amazon, because they would, you know, sanitation systems would be formalized, um, river health um, would be improved. So I do think We've got to start thinking about investment in nature, not only as you know direct investment into you know the strong, like a strong natural capital investment into biodiversity and nature, but also think about how are we investing in infrastructure that we need. You know what? How, how will we build the roads that we need? You know how will we um, invest in the sanitation systems or the, the housing infrastructure that we need? Marisol, do you want to take Steve's question on um, on the green recovery plan before I hand to, to Christoph and Shapati on on the third question? Yes, uh, thank you, Najma. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so based on, on our study, uh, the, the most important recommendation, let's say, uh, we believe that bioeconomy uh, must occupy a strategic position as an intersectoral uh, public policy. Still in, in Brazil, uh, we still have a very diffuse governance when it comes to bioeconomy. Uh, we do not have any national plan for bioeconomy, and this impacts the incentives in the Amazon area. So that's why we do believe that public spending, uh, having a national plan for bioeconomy, and we have a movement uh, arising coming from consultation for Amazon, a Brazilian coalition, different forums, national forums that are uh, picking and that are are, are uh, recommending and, and working to, uh, and making pressure to, to have a national, a national bioeconomy plan. Because nowadays still the, the spendings are concentrated into MAPA, which is the Ministry of Agriculture. And, and we do believe that having a national plan would be more transversal and, and as it needs, as bioeconomy needs. Uh, to, 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 to really uh, be a, a very structural uh, element in, in the area. 
Thank you so much, Marisol. And, and might I just encourage all of you to have a look at the FAS website to understand what, what Marisol means when she speaks about an Amazon buy economy, because it might not be what you have in your, in, in, in your mind, you know, in an economy where it's you know, led by, by big businesses, it's very much in a people-led sort of strategy for you know, a, an economy that, that preserves and conserves the forest, but also enables local communities you know, to make a living and, and to... Um, uh, to get, you know, their livelihood from the forest. Shatati Christoph, the big question, but Paul, please come in here because I know that you're working with all of us on, on getting the synthesis findings out of the work. Shatati, what would you think from, I mean, it's been months where we've spoken to one another, for one another, I think, through this moment of the pandemic. What would struck you with, you know, some of the common um, findings across the, uh, across the countries in our experiences with natural capital and natural negative investments? Yeah, uh, so one could be uh, regarding the uh, agricultural and the life sector. So I think across all the countries, uh, there has been certain uh, interventions which have very strong natural capital, for example, promotion of organic farming or um, micro irrigation uh, projects and all. And also uh, certain uh, intervention in this sector also has strong uh, negative influence on natural capital. Thanks, Shatabdi. I think yeah. the first time when India shared with us the example of, of investment in agriculture being natural capital positive, we were comparing that with the investment in Brazil, you know, in, in the agribusiness. But I think the, the importance and the richness of, of the work, and I encourage you all to look at the studies, is that in India, Shatabdi, correct me, there's a big move, as you said, you know, to invest in organic agriculture for, for states who wants to go entirely, you know, organic. And it's something that those of us on the outside we're not aware of initially we were thinking that investment in agriculture you know would be you know negative but then you know so much of the context and uh, the policy context you know um, matters christoph is there anything you'd, you'd want to add um before i see if paul wants to to bring anything perhaps on the, on the natural capital negative or um um yeah i mean uh, i agree with, with uh, shatabi because uh, in france too we have seen some improvements toward um, the agricultural transition. So yeah, most of uh, good positive impact in, uh, measures in France were uh, agricultural, agricultural measures. So that's a good thing. And But concerning negative um, measures, it's hard to say because uh, mining sectors, I mean, sectors such as mining sectors in France uh, we don't have this kind of sector in i mean in our country in our country so it's very hard to to comment we don't have any strong negative measures uh, uh in france but it's mostly because uh right now we import a lot of uh, natural resources from uh countries uh, in Africa, in Asia. So um, it's an over debate, actually. <laughs> it is indeed another debate, Chris. So thank, thanks for, 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 for that reflection. Paul, before I just, um, you know, put one question, and I'm, I'm afraid we've, we've run out of time. The questions are excellent. Please, panelists, if you have the, the time, respond to them um, directly in the Q&A. Paul, any reflections from your side? I know you're pulling everything, um, you know, together. I know you mentioned that one of the surprising findings was that, you know, investing in natural capital is also good for people because of the amount of livelihoods um, and jobs and industries that actually depend on, you know, healthy, stable um, ecosystems. Um, yeah, thanks, Najma. I mean, maybe with my last uh, minute or two, that what I'd like to do is, uh, is just maybe encourage others on this call to, to uh, delve into the analysis, as you've said, Najma, but also to and see if, if they're in in France, India, Brazil, or Uganda, whether it chimes with their own findings. There was a question about the role of civil society in the, in the chat, which I thought was particularly relevant. Civil society has a role uh, encouraging this debate and getting these kind of issues to uh, decision makers, whether they're in the public or the private sector. Uh, but I think uh, it would be great for those of you whose country isn't 
covered to do a similar kind of analysis or encourage a similar kind of analysis or even reach out to us to work with you to do a similar kind of analysis. It's frankly not rocket science. It's very uh, straightforward. You look at how much governments are spending, uh, the budget as an economist, and I'm sure uh, I'm a bit biased, but I think it's true, is the key decision-making mechanism of a government uh, and, of, and of society as a whole. If you spend a lot on uh, tearing down your forests, it's going to be bad. If you spend a lot of money on organic, organic agriculture, it's obviously going to be good for natural capital. So basically, just look at the numbers, how much is being spent by, gov by your government on different, on different aspects of natural capital and to what extent they're positive and negative. And that kind of analysis, while it's very relatively straightforward, it's amazing how little work has been done on this. This is really the first ever national studies that have been done, and, and it would be great to get more of them going. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. And I know there are many questions in the chat that we didn't get to, but we know that though 2020 wasn't the year when we could come together to, to draft, you know, a new plan, new goals for, for nature and how we, uh, we move, you know, towards a nature positive economy by, by 2030. Can I ask Mary Salcha Tabti, Christoph Aron, 30 seconds, you know, your one sort of last message, you know, for your country to be, to, to take, you know, the findings recommendations seriously, to consider them as they, um, as they try to build, uh, you know, um, rebuild the economy and um, stimulate, you know, livelihoods, but also, you know, protect the planet on, on which we all depend. Marisol, we have to start with Brazil. Your 30 seconds. Yes, <laughs> so first, first again, Najma, uh, we, we must be part of the solution. We have no more time. Amazon is, is reaching a tipping point. This would lead us to uh, a complete collapse. So we must, we must act as individuals, as uh, decision makers, and, and we, must, we must be part of the solution, not just the problem. So thank you, thank you, Najma. Thank you, Marisol. Uh, Christophe, your final words to the French government? A yeah, very, very hard question. Uh, yeah, I feel right now we are focusing too much on carbon and green, um, green uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we need to focus more on biodiversity, natural capital. We have to broad, uh, I mean, to broaden our scope because it's very important, and yet the, the situation is very, very um, critical. Yeah, thank you so much, Christoph Shatapti. Yeah, so I think uh, for the government, it is very important to identify the strengths uh, and the weaknesses, so we can build on the strengths to identify the uh, intended uh, policies that have uh, positive influence on natural capital and also to understand the unintended impacts to minimize the uh, negativities uh, to uh, that deplete natural capital. So that should be the prime focus of the government. Thank you, Shatabdi. Aaron. Uh, thank you, Najma. I think it's uh, very important to implement what has been planned. And for Uganda, we already have a starting point of having some natural capital accounts developed. So these are already in the plan. If you can implement that, then we shall go a long way in conserving natural capital because we have an ambitious industrialization agenda and it's very easy to pursue this industry and the industrialization at the expense of the environment. So we need to enforce the implementation and civil society has a key role to play here to hold government accountable and foster such conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. That would be exactly, you know, my sentiments. You know, we often think about nature as, you know, existing in the national parks or, you know, but, but nature is, is, you know, it's in the way that we live, the way we consume, the way we industrialize, the way we build our economies. And so I think first, you know, the recognition of that dependence, you know, has to be done for us to begin and identify and understand how we can plan, how we can recover and design the measures that, that protect, conserve and maintain nature. I, I thank you for the great discussion. This work is ongoing, as you can, can hear um, all of the partners. I think the hardest part comes now, having governments engage and incorporate the recommendations in, in how we recover from, from, the pandemic, from the pandemic, even as we go through, continue to grow through the phases of the pandemic in, in India, 
um, develop an alternative and engage with the uh, with the government um, in uh, Brazil. Part our partners are actively involved in the Amazon Green Recovery Plan. And tomorrow morning, Uganda will host a break, breakfast dialogue where they'll have the Ministry of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development. So hopefully, Aaron, we get to speak to the people that pull the first strings and and get this this message. And I think this team has been incredible, as Paul has said, um, working at country level to engage the key uh, processes and institutions. And I think, as uh, just to reiterate, our biggest hope is that we firstly recognize the dependence of our economies and, and societies on nature, and second, that we plan and invest and design recovery measures that, that, that protect um, this essential part of life. So a big thank you to all the presenters. And, and before we wrap up, I think, Juliet, a final message from IIED and GEC. We have two big moments coming up that we'd love to share with you. I think Juliet will post details in the chat. But IIED will host the, the Barber Award lecture on um, coming up in early December, the 6th December, that will be focused on the role of women in development. Um, it's either online or in person, if you are, happen to be based in, in the UK. And next week, the GEC is hosting our 2021 global meeting online under the theme Code Red for Nature and People, finding the best solutions for scaling a COVID green recovery. And we encourage you to join. Um, we'll be taking this discussion on a nature positive uh, economy and recovery much further. And um, look forward to seeing um, those of you who can join us there next week. So thank you so much. Uh, for joining us on the webinar and hope you all have a great day further. It was wonderful to, uh, to bring the energy and the enthusiasm of this team to a bigger community. Thanks everybody. Take care.